Hello, my name is Michael Avery from Cadence Design Systems. I'll talk about the next time family of operators in the SVA language. So the syntax is like this, uh, next time is all one word and optionally some index here. So here's an example of usage here where the index is one in this case. Now what is exactly equivalent to this is writing next time without an index because in effect next time without an index is the same as next time one. So those both exactly equivalent. So this is called non-indexed, this is called indexed. There are different forms of the next time operator. The combinations of weak or strong properties and indexed and non-indexed forms. So we'll talk about all of these as we go through. So you may have looked at this already if you're familiar with SVA and asked yourself when would this ever be of any practical use and I would agree with you. Um, it's what I call these WWY and all of these letters here. That's a initialism for why would you ever want to do that. It doesn't solve any problem that you couldn't do in a much simpler way. Okay, so here's a syntax example. This time our index is 2 in this case. And we got a sequence on the right hand side of this. So it's used in, in a normal kind of property. Um, and we're going to see what the behavior of that is in a moment. So what it, this is claiming this property is if D occurs, then after two cycles, that's because we've got an index of two here, E is required to be true. And then F must be true in the cycle after that. So this is the weak form, meaning there's no obligation once D has occurred that E and F have to occur. We could easily write an equivalent to this property in, in, in a much more readable way, in my opinion using sequences. So you notice here, instead of having next time two here, we just put hash hash two E. So, um, you know, you ask yourself the question, what is this for? And, you know, I've never found a, a, a reason in, in over 20 years. So let's have some examples of it passing and failing then. So if D is true, then the right hand side must occur. D is true, then in two cycles from now, one, two, E must be true. And the cycle after that, F must be true. So the property which became enabled at cycle zero, once F has occurred at cycle three, that property has passed. D occurs again, so we have an obligation for the right-hand side to occur, and we're expecting in one, two cycles E to occur, and it doesn't here. On cycle seven, we have no E, therefore that property fails. Here we have D occurring again, so there's an obligation for the right-hand side to occur, but that obligation is a weak one. So if verification were to end the very next cycle, and we haven't had you know time to observe the two cycles and then E, then that property does not fail. Okay, and if property doesn't fail, then it passes. So you might ask yourself, why does verification end then? Well, two reasons. If it's a simulation, we stop the simulation. If it's formal, it might be that constraints or unintentional over constraints mean that there is no further cycles to explore. But this will not be shown as a failure. So that's, that's the weak form. So that's a weak indexed form. So the difference between that and the strong form is the S underscore on the front. So there's many properties, the uh, LTL kind of properties that were introduced into the language reference manual in 2009. And if it's got S underscore on the front, it means it's a strong property. So that's the same as the previous example, other than we've got S underscore here. And the difference is, um, if D occurs, then after two cycles, E is required to occur, and then F must be true the cycle after that, that's the same. However, what's different about them the difference between strong and weak properties is that if D occurs, there is an obligation for E and F to occur if verification finishes. And again, you could easily write the equivalence of this by using the keyword strong to make this sequence strong. And if you make a sequence strong, it means it must complete. Otherwise, that's deemed a failure. So we've got the same kind of properties as before. If D occurs here, we two cycles later we get E, we must have an F the following cycle. Property enabled here, after two cycles we don't get E, therefore that property fails. But the difference is here. If D occurs on the next cycle verification ends, that's deemed to be a failure in both formal and in simulation by default. Okay, so that's that's what strong means. Strong means there's an obligation for the entire right hand side in this case to complete. So are they of any pragmatic use? I think we've already answered that one. Okay. The disadvantages are you have to remember all the different forms and the, and the different behaviours. So it's it's just asking for problems, basically. It doesn't do anything which you couldn't describe in a much more simpler way and a much more intuitive way. So all you have to know about this is what a sequence behaves like. Advantages, I've literally never seen a single one since next time was introduced in the 2009 LRM. Okay. And I don't think you can even make an argument it makes anything more readable either. Okay, so that concludes the next time operator. Thanks for listening and goodbye.